G'day and welcome to the Car Expert Podcast. We are back again today. I've got James with me. How you doing, James? Good. I'm riding solo today, sort yeah. of. <laughs> well, for now, anyway, because a little bit later on, Paul's going to come on to talk about uh, the end of the Land Cruiser V8 and uh, some spicy Model Y information that we've recently found out. But we're starting today talking about VFAX because... We are halfway through the year, and this is our mid-year update on VFAX. So uh, if you like numbers, uh, stick around. And if your numbers do a little bit too much to you, we'll, on YouTube, we've got some graphics. And if not, listen to it a couple of times. Help boost our views. Um, we're going to dive right in. Uh, so far, 632,412 cars delivered to date, which is a 8.7% increase. Yes. But. But. There's, there's a but. Yeah. Why is there a but, James? Because June was actually our first month this year where there's not been growth. So finally, you and Scott, after months and months <laughs> of predictions, uh, may be correct. But yes, there was a, a slight um, downturn in sales for June, but it was still a very high number at um, 119,000 cars. So that's yeah. still a lot of vehicles. Yeah, it is. It is interesting, though, because excluding the COVID years, which are... You know, a bit confusing in terms of... We don't of, talk about that. We don't talk about that. It's a real fever <laughs> dream. Um, since 2017, it's been on the decrease. And this is by far the worst year because in 2017, they delivered 134,000 cars in June. Mm. This year, we're down to 119 and it has reduced every year since. So, I mean, I think one of the big takeaways this year is the end of financial year sales didn't really seem to help boost the numbers very much. Like the numbers are good, but everyone was running into financial year deal to, of some description. What do you think? Is it, you know, people just tightening the budgets or just not a good offering at the moment? Yeah, I think, you know, we've we've heard from beyond our industry, the, the cost of living stuff has been a really consistent theme for, you know, Australians and families and things like that. So buying a new car may not be on the agenda. It could be that people are holding off for new things that are coming soon. Um, it could also be that, you know, fuel prices, if, if people are waiting to get something electric or hybrid or whatever, you know, they might be skipping on something cheaper because even in terms of the end of financial year sales that we were seeing, the stuff that we've reported on, it wasn't anything that drastic and it was, you know, it, I don't think there was anything super like, wow, because people are still trying to get their hands on cars that they perhaps have ordered a really long time mm. ago. Some people have been waiting for cars for 12 to 18 months. Yeah, like Tucson's have been big delays. Uh, some people have one person wrote in and said they've waited over two years for a Lexus. Yeah, and and like, you know, even just stuff that more recently, like my dad just bought a new car and he's been waiting since February. Right. And, and it's it's like a, a BMW. Well, that's, that's pretty good wait time so far. So <laughs> Yeah, but, you know, we're, we're sort of hearing from various brands that, you know, supply chains and wait times are starting to normalise a little bit. But I think we'll start to see it really normalize in the second half of the year because we'll see that return to, you know, three to four months on brand new orders for, for most brands. But yeah, I think it's just still, we're starting to see the effects of that now. It's a very delayed um, impact from all the things that we've been seeing over the last six to 12 months. Mm. All right, well, let's break down some of these numbers. Toyota is still the king, no surprise there, uh, by well, 20,903 deliveries, Ford being second with 9,493. Um, I did a little bit of math on this and we'll, we'll break down the details, but of those 9,493 Fords sold, the nine, only 937 of them were not a Range or an Everest. That's crazy to me. Like, if you work in Ford marketing, yeah, I mean, well, you've got an easy job because two of the cars sell themselves, but if you want to try and sell, a, what else do they sell? Transit? Puma. Yeah, Not I think <laughs> their van sales are increasing. And this is actually something that we've talked about a few times, right? Because I used to work at Ford for a little bit. And this was the problem is that they have two really great products that mm -hmm. do very, very well, right? But now you've got NVS looming in the next 12 months. And, you know, the average emissions of a Ranger or Everest V6 is well over 200 grams per kilometer, which is, I think, significantly higher than the caps that the government's going to put in place. So, and you know, they have a Ranger plug-in hybrid coming. I don't know how, how readily available it will be across the lineup, how expensive it'll be, whether people will even want a plug-in hybrid Ranger. Um, but Ford really needs to focus on, you know, its electric and hybrid sales. They killed the Escape plug-in hybrid, which they didn't market. Well, they didn't, um, yeah, so they didn't sell, so they Exactly right, it, yeah. so they've scrapped it. They've, the Mustang Mach-E has been a bit of a, a dog's breakfast in terms of they're just constantly price cutting it in the hope that they'll sell more because it's not really doing anywhere near the volume that it should. Actually, to be fair, I did see one on the road the other day. That's the first one I've seen on the road. Yeah, but... I think they stick out more because they yeah. are quite rare. Yeah. And, you know, they're great cars. Like, yeah. I really enjoyed my time with, I think it was the Select or the Premium, the mid-spec one. It was a really, really nice car, but a little bit generic. 
But yeah, it's not doing anywhere near, near as well mm. as it should. And they've now chopped 10 to 15 grand off the yeah. price of it and it's still not doing that great. So work to be done there. And then I think the electric Ford Puma will be here before the end of the year, hopefully, if they can get enough of them. So, but even then, what are they gonna price it at? There's so much happening in the market mm. right now. So Ford's enjoying some time in the sun right now. They're back into second, which I don't think it's been second in a very long time. Mazda's had a pretty strong hold on no. second for quite some time. Um, but yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens. And Mazda's in also in a similar boat where limited electrified vehicle sales at the moment, and they're going through this big transformational stage, but they kind of need to get a move on. Yeah, so well, I mean, they're still moving okay because they're only 10 deliveries behind Ford mm -hmm. on 9,483. Uh, Kia, fourth with 8,225. Mitsubishi, uh, 7,723. So Mitsubishi cracking the top five. Yeah. Um, um, let, let's start off there. Let's start off with where Mitsubishi have come from with those numbers because that's that's pretty good for Mitsubishi. Yeah, one of the key drivers for Mitsubishi was, is the new Outlander, which had a, an over 3,000 unit month um, in June and is now sitting at 14,400 year to date. And um, I think that's... I'm assuming it's part of the reason why is because the lower end petrol models are quite cheap and you get quite a big car for not a lot of money. And now that the um, the FEV is starting to get gather some steam, it's making up about 16% of sales now, near to date, which is a decent amount considering that the plug-in hybrid Outlander is about $17,000 mm. more than the, than the petrol one. And that could be down to the fact that with supply opening, more people are able to get them on perhaps novated leases where you get the FBT exemptions. And therefore that price gap on initial purchase price is greatly reduced once you start factoring in all the benefits that you get out of that too. Mm. So um, that, and and I think um, they're enjoying strong sales with like Eclipse Cross and, and Triton. So fairly steady on that. And the ASX continues to do well. I, which I didn't know they even still made until quite recently when we had one come through the office. I don't know when. I think the question is when will they stop? <laughs> yeah, that's, yes, it was, they've been making the same car for a while now. Um, with On the Outlander and with the FEV, uh, we'll just jump down to this plug-in hybrid sales year to date, 8,223. I think we worked out roughly uh, of those, a quarter of those are outlander plug-in hybrids something like that which yeah. is i mean that's that's remarkable because there's a few plug-in hybrids available now yeah. but it goes to show i guess it's been around for a while and are people trusting it more is that what i think now there's an incentive to actually get people to buy them because i think originally people didn't really understand the technology everyone understood evs because tesla really pioneered that and, and made people understand what it is Fevs, Mitsubishi pioneered Fev tech a very long time ago. The first Outlander Fev came out here almost 10 years ago and they were actually fairly popular and have sort of like a cult following. But in terms of wider uptake, people didn't really understand. They thought it was, you know, it's complicated because there's a plug-in element, there's a fill-up element, mm. what, what are the benefits? And I think now people are starting to understand that this is a middle point between conventional combustion tech or hybrid tech and full electrification. And so, you know, with now that there are incentives in place, much like what regions like Europe and the US have had for a number of years, it now becomes attractive to give it a try. So, and, and Mitsubishi, the top two FEVs in the country are the Outlander and the Eclipse Cross. So mm -hmm. it's probably even more than one in four FEV sales of Mitsubishi's because you've got two models there that have been selling strongly for quite a while. And that's despite really big premiums on recommended retail pricing between the FEVs and their conventional um, petrol pet counterparts. Mm, all right, so before we break down the models, uh, I'm curious to get your thoughts. Are we going to crack another million new car deliveries this year? You think we're on track for that? Um, I don't know because if, if it's going to start slowing now and we've still got another six months where, you know, things could really drop off if, you know, if, if what's been said previously is to be believed, we may just miss it. Mm. You know, we're seeing, you know, this is one of the sharpest downturns in a while and if this is the trend moving forward, we could start seeing things really sort of, go the way that it was projected a while ago. So it'll be, I reckon it'll be close. And I think depending on how manufacturers can get some of the new stuff into the country, because we've got quite a number of new launches happening from now until the end of the year, you know, we might see a mad rush to the end, or we could just see things really drop off as people wait for new cars. You know, there's a lot of electric models, a lot of hybrids, all that kind of thing coming into the country. So yeah, I think time will tell. All right, well, um, let's run through the models. Sure. Now, just because Toyota is number one in terms of uh, brands, doesn't mean they're number one in terms of models. Ranger still reigns supreme. Yeah, and by quite a margin this month. So Ranger returned um, 6,289 registrations versus the Hilux's 
5,630. And there's an even bigger drop now down to the RAV4, which is at 3,907. So the top three is quite spaced out. And if you look at the year to date sales as well, the range is now 5,000 units ahead of the Hilux and it's only yeah. gathering momentum. So, so that, and that we think is more private sales than, than fleet or government sales. Yeah, don't range we? is typically a more privately bought use compared to the Hilux, which does a lot of um, fleet sales, particularly in the 4x2 segment. So you'll see in 4x2, Hilux creams everything mm-hmm. else. But yeah, once you get to 4x4 and like the more private lifestyle buyers, you, they're really starting to choose Ranger and it's showing in the sales charts. Mm. I mean, you drive the two back to back and it's kind of a, a no brainer that the Ranger is overall the better car. Absolutely. I guess it's that longevity thing that comes with Hilux or, or the, the thought of longevity anyway. Absolutely. And I think this is probably something we'll talk about with the Land Cruiser 70 a little bit later mm. is that, you know, there's, branding can take get you a really long way. Um, but I think now, you know, we're still seeing after a number of other utes have been updated, the Ranger, especially with the V6 engine and all that kind of thing, is so much like head and shoulders above the rest, maybe with the exception of the Amarok, which it shares its bones with. But yeah, I think objectively, it's got so much capability and so car-like in the way that it drives. There's no wonder that more people are perhaps switching out of SUVs into something like a Ford Ranger. Mm. Well, then ironically, because the next couple of cars are SUVs, Outlander in fourth with 3,045, we just spoke about that. Mm-hmm. Model Y is back up in the top five again. It, it dipped our way for a bit. Um, supply issues, obviously easing a little bit with that, I think, because they've got 2,906 cars they delivered this month. Yeah, and I think another thing was that there was that big price cut a Mm. couple of months ago where we saw Tesla registrations tank massively, I think it was in April. And so there was this big hullabaloo about whether EV sales were tanking in Australia and whether people should go out and buy one. And I think it was just mainly that people perhaps cancelled their orders after seeing a $5,000 price cut and thinking about, well, maybe I should, I deserve that discount as well. And then reordering a new one. On the burner account. Yeah, Yeah, exactly right. All right. um, D-Max is is sixth. um, And then there's a big drop to, by the time you get to the next ute. Now, Aussies love utes, um, but... Uh, unless it's a Ranger or a Hilux, they're not getting a whole lot of love because Triton is way down the list and it's only done 1,783 deliveries. Now, this is the new Triton that's just come out, uh, got an extra turbo, got a whole swathe of new features, new infotainment. It's very Outlander-like inside. Mm. It just hasn't fired, has it? No, and I think part of the problem is is that it's just so much more expensive than the old one. I think a good base model is now at somewhere in the vicinity of $50,000 drive away, which is in about five to seven grand more than mm. the old one. And I think what Triton used to do so well was that it could compete with the Chinese brands on price and people would be more willing to trust the Mitsubishi brand perhaps than GWM or LDV. Whereas now you're almost looking at Ranger money for a base mm. Triton or you know the GWM Canon Alpha, which is built like a luxury SUV inside. A fully loaded one of those is the same price as a you know a base to mid spec Triton. So yeah. I think there may there are meant to be more variants coming. So there'll be cab chassis and manuals and all that kind of stuff coming to the Triton range. Hopefully that maybe picks some stuff up for them. But um, I think, yeah, Mitsubishi perhaps has to reevaluate its positioning because unless the Triton can do something that the other vehicles can't tangibly to the regular driver, I think they're going to start seeing that this is going to be where they sit. Mm. And I know that uh, Mitsubishi do have an inclination to try and get some of those fleet sales off Toyota. The problem with the fleets is they're all trying to go green with their cars, mm-hmm. right? So I guess, and obviously this is not something we generally cover in Car Expert, but, but from what you know, I mean, where where do you think we're going to see those fleet sales go in the near future? We're going to stick with utes or they're going to start going more SUVs with hybrid tech in them? Well, I think that's why we're starting to see some of the manufacturers go into various degrees of electrification. You've seen the Hilux go into the 48 volt. It's barely electrified, but yeah. Barely electrified, <laughs> but it's a difference, sure. right? And if they're, they're looking at the, the official figures, there's you know, a 10-ish percent fuel efficiency improvement and that will be bring a similar um, decrease to emissions as well. So there's a start. If people want worried about reliability, existing fleet relationships with Toyotas, um, that kind of thing. Then you've also got Ranger coming out with plug-in hybrid. Mm-hmm. So there's another option there, maybe a more premium one where, you know, for – if they can bring it in at a good enough price, you might see the the kind of cars are just idle on the side of the road. If you have a FEV, it's not emitting anything at all. You're just using it as a an electric vehicle or you can use it as a mobile generator, that kind of thing. Um, we're still yet to see some concrete stuff from the other brands. Isuzu has revealed an electric D-Max and a hybrid one, but they're still a while away from making it here. Mitsubishi has sort of hinted that there might be an electrified Triton of sorts, and they've also got an electric pickup, whether it's going to be a Triton or something else, we don't know. So there's still a lot of a way to go in that commercial space. And like, you, like we've already said, Australians rely so heavily on utes because they have a certain level of capability. 
there's not really that many options. So it'll be, yeah, like it'll be interesting to see what happens if, if manufacturers can't come to the party sooner with something that meets those needs. I mean, could Mitsubishi just rip the FEV system out of the Eclipse Cross or the Outlander and stick it in the Triton? Like, surely that's an option they would be looking at, right? Potentially, but I think what, what I, I spoke to the, the MD or the, the CEO of Mitsubishi Australia and he was saying that an important part for them and reason why it's taken so long to come to market is making sure that it keeps that capability that people expect of the nameplate. Um, and that's perhaps why the range of FEV is a FEV and not an EV, mm. like the F-150 Lightning, for example, because in Australia we need three and a half ton towing. Not that people usually yeah, use yeah. it, but people want three and people a half want, tons. Yeah. yeah, they want to have the payload. They want to have the off-road ability. And when you add an EV system with heavy electric motors and big batteries, you are potentially compromising in all these areas, the range, the convenience of filling up. There are so many factors in there that these brands are really, really having to look into. And we're one of the unique markets where we rely so heavily on commercial vehicle sales, whereas in Europe, you don't see a lot of utes. In America, they have different regulations. They have the big pickups to deal with that kind of stuff. So it's it's going to be a really interesting 12 to 18 months to see what comes out. Mm. So I think the big takeaway so far this year, SUVs are still king. They're still the most popular. And mid-sized ones at that. They're yeah, so killing you, it. For I mean, RAV4s are right at the top. It's splats. We're talking Sportage, Tucson. CX-5s uh, up yep. there still. Um and yeah, they're, they're still taking it. Their X Trail's still up there, and Nissan is doing pretty well across its range for growth. Um, but we're starting to see, yeah, small and medium SUVs are definitely where a lot of the volume's at. You've got key players from the Ute, Ute market in Ranger and Hilux leading the way, followed by D Max. Um, but you know, no one's, you're not really seeing some of the other um, makes and models be up there either. So between Tesla, <laughs> small to mid sized SUVs, and then Hilux and Ranger, that's pretty much where the the major mixes. Mm, and it's worth noting, this may be the last month that we see Tesla figures reported in Correct. BFAX, isn't it? So yes. um, enjoy the numbers. While they're there. And that'll be interesting to see how that skew, skews EV sales moving mm. forward because Polestar and Tesla now pulling out of VFAX reporting means that there's a big chunk of EV sales down that are being taken out. Well, from so, the Tesla side anyway, not from the Polestar side. Well, ex <laughs> yes. And so, you know, we've now had two or three years of really sharp uptick mm. in EV take up, driven by the Model Y and the Model 3 in particular. So, you know, it may then skew how we look at what the industry looks like moving forward because we're not accounting for the fact that Tesla's delivering X amount of vehicles that they're not reporting to authority. Mm. Now, I do note in our sort of top 20 list here of models, MG3 is nowhere to be seen. Mm. Now, obviously, they've just released a new model. Do we think that we're going to see that creep back up there or is it is it going to be too expensive now and, and Suzuki Swift is more likely to be up there in terms of the small micro hatchback, whatever they want yeah, to call it? Yeah, it's a good question because it still did good volume. I think the MG3 range still did over a 1,000 units and was top of the segment for the month. Sorry, I'm just looking at my sheet of paper. 1,287, and it was more than twice what the Suzuki Swift registered for the month. But we're To be still, fair, that's a lot of the old stock, Exactly right. Yeah. So we're still seeing that um, MG has made it very clear that they've got stock of the old one for quite a few months. So, you know, there's still an 18,990, 19,990 deal to be had there for those who really just want a new car, irrespective of what's on offer. Um, and I think they'll be able to ride that for a little bit. But, you know, the new MG3, as much of an improvement as it is, the price positioning is very interesting to me because the hybrid thing was the centerpiece of it. And the base hybrid, I think, is $27,990 before on-road costs. There's no drive-away deals. They've had to implement drive-away pricing for the petrols. But even a base MG3 petrol with no hybrid assistance and fairly high fuel consumption relative to a Yaris or, or a Suzuki Swift hybrid is... 24,990 drop yeah, away, which is the same price as a Swift hybrid. So oh. what Suzuki has been able to do in getting that car so sharply priced relative to the market that it competes in, it will force the other brands to either reevaluate how they do their lineups um, because, you know, you look at what fleet sales, you know, MG is really banked off MG3 and ZS being in, you know, rental fleets, all that kind of thing. Now that we're seeing safety standards become more and more of a thing with these fleet operators, um, fuel efficiency and stuff like that, I think we might see a really big shift there. So MG needs to be mindful that bringing new product into market, they might be significantly improved. But if you're charging the same prices as the legacy brands now, I don't know if that's going to do so well for them. Mm. And I do have to say, I drove the Swift Hybrid the other day. Thoroughly enjoyed it. It's Actually, it's a lovely little car. That new infotainment screen is, is fantastic. Yeah. There is a, set, a function in it that tells you every time a lane is merging, um, and Igor and I spent a good 10 minutes trying to figure out how to turn that off because oh, that was right. yeah, quite yeah. frustrating. But other than that, fantastic little car. And I think value for money, it's right there. Yeah, and the fuel economy um, 
claims are achievable. Yep. You'll be able to get to four to five liters and that's 800 Ks a tank without even really yeah. trying in such a little car, like you, you're laughing. Yeah, that's um, yeah, it's probably only $300 a tank instead of the usual $800 a tank you spend on other <laughs> things. Uh, look, we normally give a lot of uh, love to all the winners each month with VFAX, but I think because we're halfway through the year, we give a little bit of love to the losers because there are some brands there that uh, I am not surprised to see there. And there are some brands that I am surprised to see. So we're going to start with Citroen. Okay. Is your love language treat them mean, keep them keen? Because well, no, calling them out maybe. No, because the second one we'll talk about, I, I actually really, really like. But um, <laughs> poor Citroen, um, yes. you might have forgotten that they sell cars uh, in Australia based on the number of sales they've done year to date. James, do you want to say the number? 74 units. 74 to date, year to date. Year in to date. Six in the first months. six months of the year, they've sold 74, which is behind... Not just, you know, your usual, you know, mainstream brands like yeah. Toyota Ford, but it's behind Aston Martin, Bentley, Ferrari, and Lotus. They um, couldn't even build their car for three years. Like <laughs> Yeah, so that, that's quite telling. But on the flip side of that, it makes me wonder, you know how so many times when manufacturers cut models or they, mm. they rationalize ranges and the like, we're, we're doing it to save costs, we can't bring cars in for this level of money. Citroen can justify selling 74 cars in six months. Where's the money coming from? Yeah. Well, so so Citroen is part of a bigger group in yeah. Australia. So it's part so, of Stellantis. Which is Peugeot and Subaru as well, isn't it? No, so Subaru oh, is Sorry. yeah, Subaru is distributed by the same company that distributes Peugeot and Citroen. Yes. So Peugeot and Citroen fall under Stellantis, which is a merger between the Peugeot, Peugeot Citroen group and F Fiat Chrysler. Oh, so right. okay. basically it's now everything from like Alfa Romeo, Fiat, Jeep and um, Vauxhall and Opel. Right. Um, so our old Ford, Holden, Ford Commodore, Holden Commodore <laughs> is um, sold, well, no longer sold anymore, but was sold under the Solantis umbrella for a little while. Right. Um, but still, it's distributed by a private entity here. It's not under the Stellantis banner. It's not like Stellantis is funneling money into it. So, mm. you know. So maybe, that money is being propped up from the other brands to keep Citroen alive here, obviously. It must, but it's not like Peugeot is a huge seller here no. either. So very interesting um, stats there. Mm. Well, the, the three brands we're going to talk about now, spoiler alert, are all from Stellantis, yeah, Stellantis <laughs> Group, which it, it's a hard day to be uh, be part of that group. But next one is Ram, um, which which sads me because I love Rams. I think they're fantastic. But uh, they've only, well, I mean, they're down to, what was it? I've got the number 2,044 here. sales year today. Yeah, which is 341 this month. So. Yeah, 50% decrease. Yeah, so look, where does where's this come from? I mean, is it is it last year, obviously, they went they were absolutely going nuts because mm. you had uh, instant asset write-off and a whole bunch of stuff. People were probably a bit more flush with cash coming out of COVID. Yeah. Where's it gone? Is it the, no more instant asset write-off? What, what do you think is causing I think it? it's a combination of a few of those things. That instant asset write-off, I think at the time, Ram was one of the only players in the market with this kind of ute, whereas now you've seen it diversified with the Chevy, you've got the Ford, um, Toyota's got the Tundra on you know, their weird um, yeah, fleet, loan thing. Loan yeah. thing. <laughs> so there's now options. Mm -hmm. And we were just saying before about you know cost of living stuff. A Ram uses a lot of fuel. It's an expensive car to buy. If there's no incentives, you know, there's no instant asset write-off anymore. There's no, you know, cuts for all those kind of things. It becomes a very expensive vehicle to have as a leisure thing. So there'll be still be people that are buying it because they need the capability of a car that size. But you know, that's these kind of vehicles are the first ones that you're going to see drop when these things come into effect. And it's a it's a shame because these remanufacturing programs have created a lot of local interest industry. Walkinshaw was doing like 24 hour shifts in their factories to convert these rams, um, but now we're starting to see that initial rush slow. Look, I'm not. I believe that everything has its place, and I, I believe in consumer choice. But I think for these kind of specialty vehicles, and this goes for utes, off roaders, big um, trucks, and things like that. I think unless you need a use, a specific use for it. I think in times like this where we're starting to see people sort of have their wallets pinched a little bit or start thinking about environmental friendliness and all that kind of stuff, these are the things you're going to see drop off very quickly. Mm. And look, it is worth noting, Walkinshaw are not completely uh, up the creek because they did about 400-odd Chevys across the Silverado and the Silverado HD range. So um, between those three brands, they're still converting plenty of cars, they're still yep. selling plenty of vehicles, so it's not... It's so all doom and gloom over there in Clayton, but um, yeah, definitely down a bit. Uh, last one, uh, and a big hit in the guts for Fiat Chrysler is uh, Jeep. Um, I'm not entirely surprised by this because I think it was last year they released the new Grand Cherokee and they ditched the diesel and they ditched the V8 and all they have is a V6 in a 2.5 odd ton SUV. 
Um, but it's not just Grand Cherokee that's suffering, is it? It's Wrangler, Gladiator, none, they've all failed to fire. I mean, to date, they've done, what's my number? 1,282 yeah. sales across the range. Across the entire range. That includes Compass and this, whatever the other little yeah, one is. We, is. Yeah, Jeep's definitely in terms of volume is a shadow of its former self. There was a time when they were very, very popular. I think we're seeing the brand go through a, a time of change. They're about to re um, release their first electric vehicle in the Avenger. That'll be a $50,000 little SUV EV that you know, might really supercharge their sales, yeah. to excuse the pun. Um, <laughs> they've also got the Compass going through a big change in that it's going to be mild hybrid and FEV only moving forward, which is now coming from a new factory. So it's, you know, there's price adjustments. It's waiting for vehicles to come to market. Um, Grand Cherokee, they've recently adjusted pricing, so that might change. But like you said, losing the V8 and the diesel, I think the diesel is one of their biggest sellers. Oh, the when diesel they had was it, huge. Yeah. And, it was a, and it was a great engine. Mm -hmm. So um, I think while they're waiting for a, an updated solution, because we couldn't get the Hemi V8, in um, right-hand drive for the new generation, but they've got the new twin turbo six coming for various the Rams, the new Rams, the Rams, have it, yep. the, the Grand Wagoneer, and I believe we're, we're of the understanding that it should make it to the Grand Cherokee eventually. If they can get that here and give it like proper performance, then it sort of brings mm. it back in line with the European competitors that it's priced against. Well, and fuel efficiency because the, the it is garbage. That naturally aspirated V6 and the yeah. Grand Cherokee is. They terrible. have the Fev, but it's also very expensive. Like yeah. the the Fev Grand Cherokee is like more expensive than a Tiguan R, which mm. is uh, no, sorry, not a Tiguan, a Touareg R, Tou which yeah. is one hundred and thirty thousand dollars which boggles my mind, yes. but you know, I think um, Jeep perhaps went too hard on saying they were a luxury brand just because they were positioning cars there. Yeah. The cars are, you know, they're still good. They have their good traits and they're nicely designed and have great interiors. But I think for people to think of you as a luxury brand, you have to deliver on, you know, powertrain tech, all that kind of things. Well, yeah, and the main cars that they, they market, you know, being the Gladiator and the Wrangler, are made of scaffolding. So you can't really call them a luxury brand. Yes, that's, and they've you know, just only increased in price too. Like, yeah, you know, 20 grand base, increase on the yeah. base model Wrangler. Yeah, so I think that's that's something that has definitely not helped no. with, with them moving forward and not being able to get like a fair version of the Wrangler like you can get in the US. Because, you know, if you can start offering these options, it means people will put you on the consideration set when they're looking, thinking about their next house. Oh, I can still get a regular because it's in Fev. But anyway, that's a broader conversation. Yeah. All right. So that, that pretty much wraps up our VFAX talk. But uh, before we go, I guess, what's your key takeaway from VFAX this year to date and from new car sales this year to date? Um, well, hybrids and FEVs have been very steadily growing. And I know FEVs are often admittedly low base. But for the first six months of the year, I think it's like 120, 130% plus um, in terms of volume um, and EVs are still in the in the pluses but not quite as high as they were previously and with Tesla going um, from VFAX reporting we might see that drop quite significantly I think as it's as we're seeing more new vehicles come to market, like I'm going to the Tucson Hybrid launch this week, Hyundai recently launched a Santa Fe, you've got various other um, makes and models coming out onto the market with hybrid, plug-in hybrid and electric drivetrains. I think as we see diversity in market that perhaps opens up supply for various brands, it can still be a very interesting second half of the year. We may not see a record year, which the first few months of the year look like, but it's definitely a very interesting time and you know, with, emissions regulations coming soon. We might see a lot of strategic shifts as well in the second half of the year, which might mean people put off buying a new car until they can get the newest thing next year. So it's all it's all up to chance now. Yes, indeed. Well, have you ordered a new car or have you taken delivery of a new car this year? Leave a comment, let us know how long did it take between ordering it and actually receiving the car? Are you still waiting for it? Are you holding out for a new model? Leave a comment, let us know. And are you in the market for a new car? Well. Have I got a deal for you? Well, actually, I have a page full of them. All you need to do is go to Google, type in Help Me Car Expert, or use the QR code on the screen. It's gonna take you to the Car Expert website. We're a big company. It's like over 60 full-time employees. Very impressive. We also have a page on the site with all of the deals going in Australia this month to help you figure out which car you need to pick. We can then even put you in touch with one of our friendly dealers who might even be able to get you a better deal as well. So go to Google, type in Help Me Car Expert, or whip your phone out, scan the QR code, and away you go. All right, we said we're gonna have Paul on to talk about a couple of important things that have happened in the car world. And Paul, you're here. Hello, how you doing, mate? Good, I walked from my desk over there to hear, so it has been a long journey. I know, well, we thank you for putting in the effort to come on. Um, we hit, we got you on to talk about uh, the end of the Land Cruiser V8, mm. as we know it, like it's done in Australia now, it's out of the 300, and now, uh, as of 1 p.m. today, 
it is officially gone from uh, the 70 series as well. Yes. You have a press release, I see. I do. It's <laughs> hot off the press, yeah, so to speak. Literally. Um, so, yeah, basically uh, for Australia, and we don't know whether this is going to be for the rest of the world, but probably is given the volume of these cars that are sold in Australia. Uh, what they're saying is that for the past two years, you haven't actually been able to order a V8 Land Cruiser at all, uh, because every time you walked into a dealer, they go, <laughs> and then you just have to walk out. Or they would say, you could buy the four cylinder instead, yes. and then people just walked out anyway. Um, but uh, basically, now they're saying that they will not accept any more orders. But for the people that did have orders uh, throughout the rest of this year and into next year, they will be delivering as many of those as they can to customers. Um, and for those that were desperately missing the manual transmission, they're now adding the manual transmission to the four cylinder Land Cruiser 70 series, which uh, prior to this, it was only available with an automatic, which a lot of people were stomping their feet about, even though it's a far superior it was, transmission. I mean, I recall driving the four cylinder with the auto, it was fantastic, like, yep. yeah, nothing to complain about. But um, with that yeah. manual, it's it does seem to be shorter gears, and it's only a five speed. Yes, only a five speed, and it also has less torque, so 50 newton meters less torque. Um, but the fifth gear is longer, oh, so good. that means that it will do less for longer. Yeah. Uh, so my brother had an old Hilux that was a five-speed manual, and when you get to fifth and you're doing 100, and it's yep. the taco's right around here. I mean, that was always a problem back in the day with that. Surely it's going to be worse now. it was an issue with the V8 as well. It yeah. was sitting at you know, some abnormal amount of RPMs because it didn't have a sixth gear, and a lot of people would actually do a conversion to an auto, which would just settle things down. So it is interesting news uh, you know, for a number of reasons because this car it has been on death's door for a while now because it hasn't really met... Uh, emissions regulations, uh, well, it, it has, but it won't into the future. And it also hasn't really met safety regulations, which they tried to fix with the single cab where they added uh, side airbags and, and the elements required for a five-star rating. That five-star rating has now expired. And the funny thing is a lot of manufacturers are jumping up and down uh, to meet ANCAP requirements for five-star ratings so that fleets will keep buying them. Given this vehicle is now unrated, Fleets are still buying these, so it really is just a confusing one to me why people keep buying these for fleet vehicles if most fleets uh, have a requirement for a five-star safety rating and this doesn't have that anymore. Well, I mean, a lot of mines in Australia are just importing the six-cylinder from South Africa anyway already without ever registering it or anything, yep. so they're bypassing that. So, James, I know from March, I think, next year, all new vehicles sold in Australia have to have a bunch of safety features, and this is... Not ANCAP, that's actual ADR compliance rules. Yeah, so it's it? a new compliance thing from next year that all new vehicles sold will need to have autonomous emergency braking. I think that's the key one there. Um, the Land Cruiser 70 already has AEB, I think, across the entire range, which was something that came into effect a little while ago. But in terms of the safety requirements and the stuff that Paul was talking about with fleets, I believe that the 70 series range was bumped up into a new GVM bracket with the most recent update, which I think helped it avoid the side impact changes that came into effect a couple of years ago that killed off a few um, different passenger models. And I think they're not subject to those same things. And a lot of vehicles in that bracket aren't subject to ANCAP rules either for fleets. So I think for the, for the interim, it can still be sold in that bracket for a little while. But depending on what happens with things like the pending emissions regulations, that, that could affect it moving forward as well, depending on how they're classified. Um, so it's definitely something that we've been thinking that's going to happen for quite a while um, but it'll be interesting to see what the life of the 70 series is even beyond that because you know it's not necessarily a super efficient vehicle to begin with and they're bought in decent numbers so you know if if that's counting towards Toyota's fleet average that's something they need to think about. Well I've got a question though Go if you are watching this or listening to this uh, and you own a 70 series would you buy a four-cylinder? Because in our, all of our testing, it is faster, it is more efficient, it is just everything is better than the V8, aside from it not being a V8. Um, but would that sway your decision? Is it an issue for you? I'm keen to know. Yeah, I mean, the, the, we've tested the towing with the V8 against the four-cylinder, and the four-cylinder just felt so much nicer to tow. Yep. Might be down to the auto box more than anything, but... It does seem like an overall better thing, but I guess it's newer technology. One thing that I noted from that press release that I found really interesting, so Toyota says they've sold three, about 350,000 70 series since 1985, and 171,000 of those were V8s. So that's since 2006 or seven or whatever it came in. What do you think is going to happen to resale on the V8s now? Because traditionally people don't buy a Land Cruiser and then flip it like they would with like some rare supercar or something. This is People get them because they want them and they use them. Are people going to get a hold of these last ones, you think, and then they're going to 
be putting them on car sales for 150 grand mm-hmm. the next the next mm-hmm. week. Well, that's people, just... people have already been doing that for the last yep. little bit. While you haven't been able to order one, people have been flipping them, and you know yep. you've got manual V8 70 series GXs and GXLs well into the 120, 130 thousand dollar price bracket for whoever's willing to pay that money if they're that desperate. So I only imagine that this is just going to make that problem worse. Okay. Well, look, if you do get your hands on a uh, V8 Land Cruiser Ute and you do sell it for a profit, write to us and let us know because we want to know how much you got out of that. Um, it's going to chase some resale data, I think, for a few people Just there. Uh, four cylinders, uh, I remember I was in Perth recently and I saw a four cylinder for sale at a dealership with number plates on it for $116,000. This was either used or a dealer demo and they want 116 grand, probably. You know what else was used? The crack pipe they were using <laughs> yeah. after they wrote that price. I'd say that so. That is insane. <laughs> uh, well, it, look, that's expensive and it's a four-cylinder and it's a Land Cruiser and can only tow so much and blah, blah, blah. What would you guys be considering buying instead of a Land Cruiser? Now that we're talking that kind of money for them, where would your money go instead? Oh, let's, I mean, I'll open the floor. The Indra pickup. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, three. <laughs> yeah, and if you are interested in seeing how it compares to the 70 Series Land Cruiser, there's a link in the description below to a video that we have already shot. Yes, it's um, a great video. Watch it. <laughs> yes. Oh, I don't know. It's a hard one. Ranger Raptor. I think on the... <laughs> yeah, it's a, oh, funny. Why, why do you say that, Paul? <laughs> <laughs> I think on the flip side of the Mahindra argument, if for people who want that really old school, rugged look and feel, and they're looking in that sort of price bracket, you've got the Ineos Grenadier now, which has wagon and quartermaster ute body styles. It sort of starts in that $100,000, $110,000 bracket. You've got BMW engines, so it's powerful. It's meant to have all similar capabilities. It's in that same GVM bracket. So, you know, spec for spec, it's not too different. And they've got a cap chassis coming later this year, yes. don't they? Yeah, so you can so they've got build a, it up. And you can so. make it whatever you want. Mm. There's a really extensive range of options and accessories and they look really cool. They look like an old Defender because it's made by the people that wanted to make old Defenders. So, you know, for someone that perhaps is looking in the market now, especially if a, a flipped one or a demo is going to cost you the same amount of money, that might be something that people start looking at as well. I mean, the other options are like a Ram, Silverado, like those sort of second hand 70 level. series. <laughs> second hand, so, yes, <laughs> 20 year old 70 series. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think your options are limited. But I mean, uh, do you guys think that, that the 70s actually slipped a bit and now Rangers and D Maxes actually compete with it in terms of their capabilities? Well, I mean, I, I think people buy them for longevity and simplicity. Uh, the capabilities, I don't think, are really. I mean, they are impressive, but they're not sort of groundbreaking in any way. Um, so. I think modern vehicles, uh, like, I mean, the, the thing that just blows me away with that 70 series is the fact that the rear track doesn't match the front. So if you actually want to drive off-road in it, like in sand, you are just caning the engine because you're basically creating a, a tyre width that, that is almost double what you have currently. Like, it just, I don't know, it just seems completely stupid that they haven't thought about basic stuff like that. So. Um, I think it has a certain type of buyer and I think most people are happy to settle on a modern ute that will do most of the stuff that that will do. But will it last as long? That's the, the question, yeah, right? Come back to us in 50 years and um, we'll let you know. Okay. Uh, tune in for Car Expert Season 47, we'll tell you. Um, okay, now the next thing that we've got you on here to talk about is Tesla. Um, we'll gloss over the fact that you were quite mean to them the other week in a video. It wasn't well, mean, was I was just pointing out harsh facts. Fair, yes, harsh and then fair. the Tesla fanboys were like, oh, the <laughs> mainstream media. It's like, no, lots of depreciation. Yep. That's what's happened. Yeah, But thanks for calling us mainstream media, uh, YouTube commenters. <laughs> it's much appreciated. <laughs> uh, but no, just today, literally today, we've received some spy photos of Model Y. Now, you recently sold your Model Y. It was getting yes. a bit older. Uh, Model 3 got updates. What are we expecting with this Model Y update? So it's called the Juniper. That is the, the code name. It's so a T, isn't it? I don't <laughs> know. Flowers it doesn't sound very appealing, whatever it is. Um, but it is basically going to follow Model 3 in terms of what they've done. So headlights, tail lights, and probably interior. Um, we don't know the full details, but it is likely to just mimic that. One thing that we did miss out on that China got was an update to the current Model Y, which included new um, LED lighting, and they changed uh, some of the paneling inside the cabin as well, um, and also updated the specs on the car. So it was actually faster and had more range. So for some reason, we didn't get any of that. Um, and there are currently, I think, two boats coming to Australia with Model 3s and Model Ys. So um, 
we must just be getting the old stock they need to clear that they are having a lot of trouble clearing at the moment. So um, if you are in the market for one, so I'm in two minds, right? So I got rid of my other Model Y because like uh, we said in the other video, if you haven't watched that other video, there's a link in the description below. It's a big description um, this week. <laughs> yeah, the depreciation is horrendously bad on Teslas and it is because they keep toying with the prices and now a lot of people trying to dump them on the second hand market and the, the prices are just completely collapsing. Um, so if you are going to buy another one as part of a lease or you do want to update your current one, I would just hold off a little bit because I still think the Juniper is probably six to 12 months away from, from being in Australia. So if you can't wait that long, I think between now and then there will be an update that will mimic what they have in China. So you're going to get more range and uh, faster acceleration as well. And my other point as well is that I'm in two minds about whether I would upgrade to it because... We test drove the Model 3 uh, Highland a little while back and you know, I, the indicators and all that stuff were fine, but my wife predominantly drives our car. She's not a car person and I just think it is needlessly complicated to have wipers and all that other stuff on the steering wheel and I just don't know that she would like it and if she doesn't like it, I'm not going to buy one. So uh, in my mind, I'd probably buy that, that middle gap in between, which is the, the non-facelift without the missing stalks and all the stuff that a car should have. Um, is probably where I'd sit. So if you are about to buy one, just hold off a little bit. I think, A, they're going to drop prices a little bit more because these cars are now starting to, to languish. The, the cars that they have in stock haven't moved. They've got another two ships coming. So you're just adding to the stock issues. Uh, and then further to that, people that now see these spy photos and changes are probably just going to, to go, um, okay, well, I'm not going to order anything. So, um, yeah. Interesting time ahead. Mm. I mean, Definitely. as we spoke about earlier in the podcast, before you came on, we talked about VFAX, that Model Y was the fifth best selling car in June. So, I mean, um, James, you probably speak more to this. Like, that's, that's a resurgence of uh, arrivals into the port more than people actually going out and buying one. That's right? registrations. Registered, yeah, delivery. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's the important thing to stipulate is that I reckon there was a drop because when that major price cut happened a couple of months ago, I think a lot of people just cancelled their orders, which meant there were cars that were coming in off a recent build batch and then came in and they were all cancelled orders and then people will probably order the new ones at the new prices and they're the ones that we're starting to see come in now. Um, and look, the Teslas have still got enduring popularity at the moment where they're still fairly solid and outselling most of their competitors. But with more things coming soon, we've got um, Kia EV5, there's a, few, a number of other new... What is happening with that, by the way? Why is it delayed again? Yeah, there was a <laughs> there was a software and wheel upgrade done at factory level, which I think now they have to apply to all the stuff that first came into the country. And now I think the, the media and market launch will be um, sometime in the third or fourth quarter. But all variants will launch at the same time. I think originally it was going to be a staggered okay. launch between like Earth Air and then right. GT Line towards the end of the year. Now they're all going to launch at the same time, probably... I would say around October, November, but um, I think 40 of them were registered last month in preparation for the launch that I was meant to attend at the end of June. So, yeah, uh, but there could also be that they're trying to readjust pricing. You know, the, with Tesla changing prices again, Kia may have had a very strong starting point in what they had planned, and then this has meant that they're changing again because we had a similar thing. I think Volkswagen did the same thing with the ID4. They haven't announced pricing yet because things keep fluctuating. So a lot of the other brands are sort of waiting and seeing what happens and then, you know, announcing things at the very last minute. Realistically, both Kia and Volkswagen would need to have pricing that matches or betters Tesla if they want to stand a chance. Absolutely, because, yeah. Like I said in that other video, at 55900 that Model Y is such good value for That's money a bargain. that yeah. you would be crazy to buy anything else. Um, so it just seems really odd to me that um, anyone would launch something now and not have, have that taken into consideration. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Well, that pretty much brings us to the end this week, guys. Paul, I want to say thank you so much for taking some time out of your busy no, schedule. Look, it's, it, was, it was a long journey know, from my was. desk over there. Yep, yep. Um, no, I know. You're a very busy man. Before I let you go, uh, got anything interesting on the horizon in terms of reviews or uh, trips? Um, yes. So we're, we're going to be releasing something soon, a video about Waze, because if you're like me, you religiously use Waze so that you know where the naughty police are. Um, not because I speed, but just because it's useful to know. And I also use it so I know the speed to go through a speed camera. We test so many different cars and the, the speedos all completely vary. They're almost, well, they are always uh, within a safe tolerance. But to me, I want to know with GPS speed, which is far more accurate, 
how fast I need to go through a speed camera. And there are so many of them in Victoria, two kilometers an hour over and you'll be, you'll be done. So um, we wanted to see how accurate it is. And we've got a video coming where we actually tested um, ways on both Android and Apple to see how accurate it is up against a laser speed measurement device and also how accurate a car speedo is as well. So that will be a fun little video. Mm, so make sure you are subscribed to the YouTube channel if you want to see that. James, any final thoughts from you this week? Um, I'm going to be driving the updated Hyundai Tucson this week, including the hybrid, which I know is a very anticipated vehicle and it's entering a very competitive segment. So I'm um, excited to see if it's any good. And then you'll hear more about that at the end of next week. Um, and Paul will also be shooting a video on one. So plenty of content coming from that. Yeah, stay tuned to find out if that can topple the RAV4. It probably can't, but well, you know, you never know. <laughs> Anything's possible. That RAV4 is a beast, though, as we've seen in this month's VFAX. It is still right up there. So, uh, yeah, if you uh, have enjoyed the podcast, please leave us a review on uh, whatever podcast platform you're listening to. Make sure you click follow it if you're on YouTube. Hit that subscribe button. Give us a like. Leave a comment. Let us know your thoughts. Uh, what do you think? Do you want to see more Paul on the podcast? Paul, do you want to be on the podcast more? If you bring more snacks. All right. Well, like KFC. <laughs> if, you, if you leave podcast. a comment, we'll buy some KFC and we'll have Paul back on the podcast <laughs> again in the near future. But in the meantime, thank you so much for watching and we'll see you all next time.